hope you all had a great week and a happy 4th of July, uh, if you saw fireworks or not. Uh, but as we mentioned last week, Steve and his family are still up in Oregon visiting Stevie, so uh, please pray for them to have a good trip and to travel back safely. Um, Stacy made it to Taiwan, <laughs> so keep praying for her. And today we have Maddie singing with us. Yay, Maddie! <laughs> Um, yes, thank you. Yay. Um, but yes, we're all glad to be, we're glad to be here together. And um, today we're going to take the Lord's Supper. So I just hope that as we, as we sing today, as we uh, partake in um, this, this routine of, of taking the Lord's Supper, that we will continue to have it be fresh and new on our hearts and our minds to remember what God has done for us and to remember how he sacrificed himself for us. And he, and he paid the ultimate price so that we could know him, so that we could have freedom um, and that um, it is by his grace and by his grace alone uh, that we can have salvation. So let's bow our heads today and let's prepare our hearts to come before our God um, and to come and praise him and to sing to him. Um, let's pray together. Dear Lord, we just thank you for everything that you have done for us, Lord. We thank you that you are a God of, um, of miracles, that you are a God of promises, Lord, and that you keep your promises, that you are always the same. And we know that we can trust in you, Lord. God, we thank you for what you have done for us on the cross. And we thank you for your love and that you uh, made a plan so that we could be redeemed, so that we could know you. Um, we thank you that it is by your grace that we can have freedom and that we can have salvation. And I pray that you would be with us today as we sing, as we praise you, as we listen to your word. And may we hear your Holy Spirit speak to us. And we pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand and sing together.
cast my mind. Cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. today to come before God and to remember his sacrifice, that as we uh, take the bread and drink the wine, that we can remember his body that was broken for us and his blood that was poured out for us and trust that and that we know that we can um, take power in his resurrection and know that we have been set free from the, from the chains of sin and we know that he has brought us life.
how deep how deep the father's love for us how vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure how great the pain of searing loss the father turned his face away as wounds which mark thank you so much for your amazing love for us God we thank you that in your love you chose to give us your one and only son to die for us to take the burden of sin upon his shoulders to be separated from you in that moment Lord so that we could be reconciled to you so that we could be called your sons and daughters and God I just pray that as we Take the Lord's Supper and remember your sacrifice. I pray that you would continue to give us so much gratitude for the life that you give us, Lord. That we know that you give us freedom, that you have paid the price for our sin, Lord. And I pray that we will continue to trust in you, that we will continue to walk with you, that you would give us the love and joy and peace that we know that we can find in you. Thank you that we can come before you and that we can 
pour out our desires and our thoughts and um, what is on our hearts to you, Lord, and that you listen to us. And how amazing is that, that you want to hear what we have to say. God, we thank you so much uh, for your love. We thank you for your sacrifice. And we thank you for this time that we have here today to be before you. We pray these things in your holy name. Amen. You may all be seated. I'd like to invite Pastor Paul up for the Lord's Supper. As we come to the Lord's table, please listen to the word of the Lord written by St. Paul. For I receive from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. Thank you for the honor to take part in this holy communion we believe you are here with us it is you who have invited us to sit at your table heavenly father thank you for sending your beloved son jesus to give us a new life to receive forgiveness of sins and to have hope in your eternal love and life. Through Jesus our Savior, we pray. Amen. Let us take the bread. And let us eat the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us drink the wine, the blood of Jesus our Savior shed on the cross for all our sins. We pray, O oh Lord, as we go, may we always bring with us the crucified body of our Lord Jesus Christ to proclaim the forgiveness of sins. As we go, may we also bring with us the resurrected body of our Lord Jesus Christ to proclaim there is eternal life through Jesus, our Savior, and our Lord, we all pray. Amen.
I don't say this often enough. I just want to say I really appreciate the Lifeline worship team, Carissa, Sean, Hong, and of course Rachel before and the rest. In season and out of season, they always faithfully serve the Lord. Even when they were living in San Diego, every week they come here, every week. They never missed a Sunday. So, thank you. Will you please turn your Bible? Yeah. Yes, they deserve it. Please turn your Bible to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And we are just going to read one verse today, verse 9. We in the Indonesian service have been studying the book of 1 Corinthians. Now we have come to this chapter and this verse. I'm going to read to you 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the same Spirit. So let's just focus on one today. To another, faith by the same Spirit. Okay. The theme of today's message is a tool to do the work. One of the words that we often read in the Bible and hear in the church is faith. Now we see that the gift of the Spirit, the third one listed by Paul here is faith. So let us ask, what is faith? Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 gives us, not 12, I'm sorry, 11, gives us a definition of faith as the confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. J.B. Phillips translates it, now faith means putting our full confidence in the things we hope for. It means being certain of things we cannot see. So based on this definition, we can extrapolate what faith is not and what faith is. Firstly, faith is not hoping and faith is not seeing. Even though faith has an element of hope in it, faith is not hoping. Faith is more than hope, so much more that it changes hope into full confidence without any threat of doubt. So let me explain more. Hope says, I hope it will rain. While faith says, I know it will rain. Hope says, I hope God will get me through this. While faith says, I know God will get me through this. Hope says, I hope God will heal me. While faith says, I know God will heal me. So that's the difference between hope and faith. Somehow... We often think that as Christians, we should have faith, not hope. Well, let me say this. There is nothing wrong with hope. And it is not a sin to hope. Further, hope is not an inferior form of faith. And faith is not a superior form of hope. Simply put, there is time and place for hope, and there is time and place for faith. We need not change everything into faith, and that includes hope. Let hope be hope. When I was at your age, I was in my 20s, in this church, I remember we had a retreat once. And then after the retreat, or during the retreat, somebody, a female friend of ours, came to me and said, Hey, Paul, I think I am facing a big problem. I said, what happened? So and so, a guy, approached her after a prayer meeting in the retreat and said to her during the prayer meeting, God spoke to me that you will be my wife. 
Well, what should I do? So I asked her, what did you say to him? He said this, very wise. Well, if God really wanted me to marry you, I pray that he will also speak to me the same thing. And of course, he never did. And so in the end, they both married somebody else and lived happily ever after. But this is what I appreciate about this friend of ours, this guy. Later on, after he matured in his faith, he actually went to this friend of ours, the female friend, and said to her, I want to apologize to you. That actually, it was not God. It was me. Because I like you. <laughs> well, what my friend should have said to this female friend of ours was, I hope to marry you. Not that I know God want me to marry you. No. I hope to marry you. So once again, folks, there is a place for hope. There is a place for faith. So let hope be hope. You see, hope is not a sign of doubt or a lack of faith. Sometimes this is what we think of hope. We don't have enough faith. That's why we just hope. If it were, it would then be something we must improve or upgrade. So when we say, I hope God will heal me, we're not doubting God or showing no faith that he will heal us. When we say, I hope God will heal me, it simply means that we are asking God to heal us and that we trust in his power and goodwill to heal us. But we do not know his plan for us. We do not know whether his plan is for us to live or die. Hence, we should not say that we will be healed. We can only hope to be healed. So, once again, it is okay to hope because hope, like faith, only leads us to God. The Bible shows us that the prophets of God, such as Elisha, Jeremiah, and in fact, the 12 apostles of Jesus our Lord, died. It is obvious then that it is not in God's plan to always heal us or to rescue us from dangers. Death is in the plan of God because eternal life in its fullest will only be given after, not before we die. So do not hastily say, by faith I know God will heal me. Unless we know for certain that God will heal us. And we can only say for certain that something will happen as we prayed for if we know His will. So here's a lesson that we can learn. Faith is not blind. Faith can and must be able to see God's will. A lot of chaos, a lot of misunderstandings, and sometimes a lot of hurts and disappointments happen because of this matter. Because we claim something without knowing fully whether or not it is God's will. So in matters of faith, I'd rather that we be slower, more cautious, rather than be more bold or in the end, reckless. Because by doing so, I believe, we have caused a lot of hurts and confusion. This brings us to the second part of what faith is not, which is, faith is not seeing. Hebrews 11 verse 1 defines faith as putting our full confidence in the things we hope for. It means being certain of things we cannot see. So, faith must be able to see God's will. But faith must not be able to see evidence or outcome. 
Let me explain. When Thomas said, unless I see in his, in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and my hand into his side, I will not believe. When he said that, he showed unbelief. That Jesus had risen from the dead. So when Jesus himself finally showed himself to Thomas and told him, Reach your finger here and look at my hands. And reach your hand here and put it into my sight. And Thomas believed. His belief did not come from faith. It came from evidence. No wonder our blessed Lord then said, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen, yet believe. So, faith must be blind. Faith is not blind in the sense, faith must be able to see God's will. But, Faith must not be able to see evidence or outcome. As I said, there's time and place for hope, and there's time and place for faith. And now is the time and place for faith, not hope. Thomas and we all must come to God with faith, as clearly stated in Hebrews 11, verse 6. But without faith... It is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So you see, on one hand, faith is not blind, because it must see God's will. But on the other hand, faith is blind because it cannot see evidence or outcome. The moment it sees evidence, it stops being faith. Like in the case of Thomas. His belief did not come from faith. Because it came from evidence. Coming to God requires faith because he exists in the spiritual realm. Thus, can only be perceived by faith. We cannot see and relate to God in any other way. We can only see and relate to Him with faith. Believing without doubt that He exists. Faith is not hoping and faith is not seeing. So what is faith? Hebrews 11 verse 1 tells us that faith is confidence and certainty. Confidence and certainty. Eugene Peterson in the message translates it succinctly. It's our handle on what we cannot see. Faith is our handle on what we cannot see. Did we see God create the universe then? No. Did we see Jesus our Lord die on the cross and rise, and rise from the dead? No. Did we see heaven? No. We did not see any of it, but we know it with faith. Our handle on what we cannot see. Let's continue. Now we know what faith is, let us ask. What is faith as a gift of the Spirit? Is it different from faith in general? Here's the answer. We have faith just like we have wisdom and knowledge, the first two gifts. But to be called gifted in faith, we must possess it in extraordinary measure. And we ought to be able to show it consistently. Just like to be called gifted in wisdom and knowledge, we must have them in extraordinary measure and can show them consistently. As I said, faith is not blind. It must see the will of God. 
So those who are gifted with faith by the Holy Spirit are given a special ability to know the will of God. Unlike most of us who must painstakingly discern the will of God, those who are gifted with faith, they somehow know or can see the will of God clearly. Let me give you an example. To punish Ahab and Israel, the Lord God withheld rain from falling for three and a half years. During which time God provided for Elijah through a Sidonian widow in Zarephath. The Bible tells us that when Elijah first asked the woman to give him water and bread, she refused. Because what she had was only enough to feed her and her son just for a meal. But Elijah assured her, Do not fear. Go and do as you have said, but make a small cake from it first and bring it to me. And afterward, make for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, The bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry, until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. And that's exactly what happened. So you see, Elijah the prophet knew the will of God. God told him that. He therefore could confidently and with certainty tell the widow to share the food and water with him. Because God would supply her needs throughout the drought. So you see, Elijah had an extraordinary amount of faith. Or the gift of faith. Because God had given him the special ability to know the will of God. Or we could also say that God had revealed to him his plan. And based on this revelation, he acted his faith out. So, gifted with faith is basically having a very intimate relationship with God. To the point that we can discern, hear clearly the will of God. And based on that revelation, we act it out. That's called gift of faith. Perhaps we are now wondering what Jesus our Lord meant then when he said to his disciples in Mark 11, 22 to 24. Have faith in God. For as shortly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. What did Jesus mean by this? Did he mean that whatever it was that we asked, if we believe we would get it, we would certainly get it. Well, to know what our blessed Lord meant, we must know the main message that he was trying to teach his disciples. And the message was not, whatever we pray for, we will surely receive it because God is obligated to give us what we pray for. No. We know it couldn't, be, it couldn't possibly be because Jesus himself did not receive what he asked for in Gethsemane. To be spared from crucifixion.
So what was the main lesson he tried to instill in the minds of his disciples? Here's the lesson he wanted them to learn. Do not doubt God. That was the lesson he was teaching them. So when we come to God and ask him for something, do not doubt his power and goodwill to give us what we pray for. He is our heavenly father who loves us so much that he gave his only son. So the only thing that will stop him from giving what we pray for is his plan. So when we pray, do not doubt God and do not doubt his good plan. Instead, trust his plan and surrender to him. I remember years ago when I was in college, Johnny Arachantada came to our school and spoke in our chapel. She shared that in the early part of her Christian walk, some Christians, of course, out of goodwill, pray for her healing. They kept praying for her, by faith you will be healed, by faith you will be healed. But no, she wasn't healed. And of course, she could not count how many times she prayed to be healed. As you know, that she suffered quadriplegia as a result of the diving accident that, he, that she suffered at the age of 17 years old. Did she pray with faith? Yes. Did Christians who pray for her pray with faith? Yes. So what happened then? Then Jesus said, if you pray and you believe you have received it, then you will have it. That's why I said to you, the lesson that he was trying to instill in us is, just do not doubt God. When we come to God, if we already have doubt, what should we even come to him? So do not doubt him, but believe this and know this. The only thing that will stop him from giving what we pray for is his plan. That's all. He's good to us. Do not doubt that. He loves us. Do not doubt that. He's all powerful. Do not doubt that. But he has his plan. Before I conclude, let me leave you with these thoughts. First, the gift of faith is not claiming that something will happen. It is knowing the will of God and acting it out accordingly. You see, it is one thing to know, and it is another thing to act accordingly. So if we do not know the will of God is, do not claim that we do. But if we already know it, by all means, say it and do it. I'll give you two examples in which one, I failed to obey him. And second one, in which I obeyed him. The voice of the Spirit. Once we were having this retreat, faculty retreat, and during the service, I believe I heard the voice that said to me, ask everybody to just kneel and to just pray. It was not me who was speaking in the service. I was just attending it. I just thought, oh no, I don't think I should do this. I would mess up the whole program. So I just sat through it. After the service, while I was talking to a colleague of mine, I shared with her that somehow I felt a sense that was the Holy Spirit speaking to me. And she said this to me. That's exactly what I heard. And how I wish you had done that. Because somehow, 
That's what he said to me too. I failed. I thought I heard his will. I did not act on it. Another example. It was again in the Bible school. During the service, it was somebody else preaching. Somehow the voice came to me saying, after the end of the service, go up to the stage and tell the people that there's a cloud, dark cloud, hanging over all of you. So you must watch out. And every time you hear this kind of voice, or I don't know about you, but me, every time I hear this kind of voice, I just say, oh, no. But thank God, I decided to go up. And people were kind of surprised, shocked, not knowing what's happening. How come I just walk up without being called? And I just said, look, I just want you to know, God told me there is a cloud, dark cloud, hanging over us here. So we must watch it, pray, protect ourselves with faith that God will protect us from these dark clouds. And then I just walked down. And of course, another faculty member who was my superior called me and said, don't you ever do that anymore. <laughs> but this is what I want to tell you. Within the week, a student came to me and said to me, I just want you to know that some of my friends were struggling so hard. They are so depressed. Some of them at the end of the rope. So when you came up and said that, we knew that God was watching over us and warning us. And then later on, a faculty friend of mine who is also a counselor at the school told me this. Somebody, a student, came to me and said, actually, she was already on the third or the fourth, the third floor. She was ready to jump. She wanted to commit suicide. It was that dark. It was that dark. I wish I could tell you that, yeah, I was always obedient to the voice and just act it out. But no, sometimes I fail. But that's what the gift of faith is. Those who have the gift of faith don't doubt like me. Don't chicken out like me. They know it's God's will. They know this is what God is saying. And then they just act it out. Eugene Peterson in the message translates faith as simple trust. I cannot agree more. Faith is given to those who are pure and simple. So pure and simple that they can hear and see God's will. So pure and simple that the moment they hear it or see it, they will just act it out. We can then say that the gift of faith is given to the childlike. The more childlike, the more the faith. Many of you know Tante Yanti, Noodle Stars. But perhaps many of you don't know that years ago, she suffered from cancer. It was serious, advanced age. And uh, she was getting ready for a bone marrow transplant. We were all praying for her. And out of the blue, right before the bone marrow transplant, the doctor said, your cancer is gone. 
And thank God, she's still healthy to this day, and she has remained strong. She's still working at the Noodle Stars. Every time I ask her or talk to her about this matter, she only gives me this simple answer. Just trust him. Percaya aja. So I conclude that those who have the gift of faith are far from our imagination, usually like they are so strong, mighty, powerful. No, they're just like a little child. Childlike. Percaya aja. Just trust. So the more childlike, the more the faith. If the gifts of wisdom and knowledge are given to show the way, we discussed it last week in our uh, service. The gift of faith is given to do the work. Faith is what will unleash the power of God to do His work. Hence, the greater the faith, the greater the work. So, blessed is the church that has the gift of faith. God will entrust her with more work. Simply put, blessed are the church in which there are more and more childlike members. Childlike members. Because the more childlike members we have, the more God will entrust us with his work. Here's the last thought. Those who are gifted with faith must watch out for ambition. They must constantly check and recheck whether what they want to say or do is of God or of themselves. It is so easy to mislead others and even ourselves into believing that it is God who speaks to us and who wants us to do something. And sadly, many have fallen sideways because of ambition. I remember meeting this missionary who said that God has called him to this particular country to plan a thousand churches. My first reaction was, wow. But I dare not make any judgment, of course, because... It's between him and God. But let me tell you this, not, not even three years or four years, maybe less than that, he already returned to his home country. I don't really know what happened from what I just heard here and there, family issue. Well, sometimes because of ambition, we like this gift of faith so much. Because when we say things, this is what God says, nobody will dare to rebut us. They will say, oh, well, okay, this is God's will then. So, be careful. Watch it. I don't know if you know of Cindy Jacobs. She's one of the women God used in America to bring a lot of healing and revivals. She even said, those who are gifted with prophecy can also make a mistake. Sometimes, she said, we just don't really know for sure. We cannot really discern God's will. So even she, who has been used by God tremendously, still walk cautiously. So walk closely with God. Always ask Him to purify our motives. Is it God who wants it? Or is it I? You see, we may begin with faith, but if we're not careful, we will end up with ambition. And the moment ambition takes over, we will wreck God's work. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, you want to use us to do your work. And therefore, you give us the gift of faith. Lord, it is a scary thing to have because we cannot see evidence. We cannot use our rational mind. We must just trust you. So Lord, as we walk by faith, help us walk cautiously, but also faithfully. Just trusting you with a simple trust. Through Jesus, your son, we all pray. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Paul, for speaking for us today. I pray that as we sing together again, um, that we will continue to see how uh, the Spirit has given us this gift of faith and see how uh, we can take more steps of faith in our life, that we can trust in our God who is always there for us. Uh, so let's all stand and sing together.
Let's bow our heads and pray once again. God, we thank you so much that you are our cornerstone. We know that we put our faith in something that is so powerful and so strong, Lord. We know that you will never fail us, uh, even when we face the storms of life. And we thank you and we praise you for that. And just pray that uh, in those times when we when we hear you say something to us, Lord, when the spirit that you have given us moves us to do something, I pray that you would help us to obey, Lord, and to have the faith to be able to know your will and to do what you say, knowing that as we do so that we will be able to experience more of, of the will that you have for our lives, more of your power, more of your miracles, Lord. I pray that you would help us to not miss out on that. Lord, help, help us to trust in you. And we thank you that you, um, that you are so faithful, that we know that we uh, can always trust in who you are. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. You may all be seated. Well, Ryan's going to walk around with the offering. So thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, announcements for this week. We do have prayer meeting this Thursday, so that's Thursday at 8 o'clock online on Zoom. So please join us for that if you would like to pray together. Um, I hope you all have a, have a great week. Stay cool, and we'll see you next week. Happy Sunday.